everybody and welcome to our next lecture on marine microbes. So we're finally getting into the marine biology part of marine biology, which is the actual living organisms. So this is where it gets really cool. So we're going to start out from the very, very small, the microbes, the microscopic. We're going to move to plants and algae, and then we're going to actually get into the animal phylum, starting with periphera, ending with echinodermata, well, really ending with chordata. Um, the vertebrates. So we're going to be getting into a lot of really, really cool stuff. Make sure that you guys are paying attention to the taxonomy. If I say phylum, annelida, you know, class polychaeta, you need to know both of that. And don't just remember annelida and polychaeta. Really, really pay attention to phylum, annelida, class polychaeta. Say it like that because when it comes down to these exams and stuff, I might ask you, what's the class? And you can be like, well, I, I uh, it's Annelida, is that the class or the phylum? I don't know. So make sure that you guys are really, really, really paying attention to that. Um, super critical for these next couple lectures. Like I said, all the way from marine microbes to, uh, I believe, Echinodermata, we're going to be doing our next exam after Echinodermata. So this is all of the invertebrates. So your your test three is going to be all on vertebrates, like the fishes and the elasmobranchs and stuff like that. But when we're talking about the invertebrates, test two this is probably the biggest and the longest and possibly the hardest test of the whole semester because we're covering so many different phylums. And yes, you really, 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 really do need to know all of them and their differences. So make sure when you guys are paying attention, you're paying attention to the differences and, and how each of these phylums is separated and why. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started with marine microbes. Again, this is where it gets really cool, guys. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. All right, so we're going to be focusing on the six kingdoms. Now, there are six major kingdoms uh, that we're going to be focusing on. Archaea bacteria, right? These are kind of the archaeans and the bacteria. These are kind of in between the archaeans and the bacteria, hence archaea bacteria. The eubacteria, which are true bacteria, and both of these are going to fall under the prokaryotes. Small, simple, very, very tiny, very simple, not complex, no internal organelles. Finally, when we get to the eukaryotes, this is going to be your protista. These are kind of like your amoebas and like the whole generalized group that we don't know exactly where to put them in. We just kind of put them in protista. Then we have the funguses or the fungi, the domain fungi, or sorry, kingdom fungi, which is the funguses. Again, things like mushrooms and molds. We have kingdom plantae, which are all your plants. And then find them, we have kingdom animalia, which are all your animals. So these are the six kingdoms, kingdoms that we're going to be focusing on. And yes, you do need to know that they are six kingdoms and that they are kingdoms. All right. Now here, are, here we are in the domain. So even bigger than kingdom is domain. So domain is the biggest, most inclusive group. So this basically means the largest. So the domain eukarya has all eukaryotic cells in it. So your plants, your animals, your funguses, your protists, they all fall under the domain eukarya. Just like all bacteria fall under the domain prokarya. Okay, so again, we have the domains eukarya or uh, bacteria or archaea. You can see domain bacteria is also sometimes called prokarya. Same kind of thing if you hear me say either one. It's basically the same thing. So the three domains are eukarya, bacteria, and archaea or prokarya. Um, now, they're divided into two different types of cells, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. The prokaryotes, like we just mentioned, are, again, small, simple, not a lot going on, no internal organelles, whereas the eukaryotes are much larger, much more complex, and basically have everything else, the plants, the animals, the funguses, as you can see right here. Now, here's where the six kingdoms kind of fall into these different domains, but this is, can be a little bit confusing, so we're going to actually wrap this up, and we're going to make it a lot clearer when we get to each of the phylums. Right now, you just need to know that there are three domains and six kingdoms. Now, not even talking about anything that we just talking, talked about, but backtracking a little bit to viruses. Now, viruses are kind of their own little thing. They don't really fall under this good definition of a group like some of these other domains do. And that's because they're not technically considered alive. Remember, these guys cannot reproduce without a host. You have to be free living without a host at some point in your life, and these guys can't reproduce without a host and therefore aren't considered alive. And there's other reasons why. We're not really going to get into it. But we do need to talk a little bit about it, especially because it's the reason that I'm lecturing to you from my kitchen right now and not from a classroom is because of viruses, specifically the COVID-19 coronavirus. So these guys are known as non-cellular, meaning not really true cells, infectious agents. So they're called agents again because they're not really considered organisms, not really considered alive. So these guys are not capable of replicating without a host cell, which means they're not free living, which means they can't really be classified as alive. 
Now they do have DNA or RNA, so they do have this genetic code, this you know DNA inside of them. Um, but it can also affect our DNA, so it's really kind of it's kind of wonky how they actually work. Now they are protected in what's called a protein coat or a capsid, and this capsid does kind of help them protect themselves against things like our immune system. Thank you, silly little capsids. But it works great for them. What also works great for them is these glycoprotein spikes, which you can see right here. So this is a typical picture of a virus. We have our genetic material on the inside, either DNA or RNA or whatever. And then these are the glycoprotein spikes on the outside. These are what kind of identify these host cells and latch onto them and get onto them. And basically that's what they use to infect because what they'll do is they'll take their DNA and they'll inject it into your cells. And then your cells go through cellular replication like mitosis or meiosis. And then your cells start replicating with the virus's DNA. So great on the virus, not so great on our immune system and really hard to get rid of. Again, that's why I'm in my kitchen right now. Now there are a couple different types of viruses. There are regular viruses and there are retroviruses. Dad joke in one of the lectures? I know, look at the funny little wig and he's got little disco glasses on. Anyway, let's talk about the actual retroviruses that I want you to know. These retroviruses basically are retroviruses because they're using a form of RNA. Not a DNA, but an RNA. So this is where they're getting their genetic code from. Um, there are lysogenic viruses. Lyso kind of means to burst. So these guys are kind of going to be bursting. And again, they don't want to explode their, cell, their host cells, but sometimes they end up doing it. But really what we're looking at is they're injecting their DNA or RNA into the host cell. And again, remember those glycoprotein or the glycospikes they basically attach onto and then with the attach on, they infect you with their um, DNA or RNA. And that's again, the lysogenic ones. So retroviruses are kind of storing their genetic material as RNA. Lysogenic viruses are infecting us with their DNA or RNA. And then bacteriophages, bacteriophages, really these guys are affecting bacteria or infecting, um, infecting bacteria. Yes, you do need to know the differences between these bacteria or these viruses, but it's just as simple as knowing the definition and that's it. We really don't talk too much more about viruses um, other than just this little introduction, except for the fact that we should mention that everything in the ocean and the surrounding areas is a risk of getting infected by one of these viruses. So a lot of different organis organisms will have these different mechanisms to defend themselves against viruses, but these are the ones that they're trying to get rid of or trying to defend themselves from. Now, like I said, they are very, very common in the marine environment. They infect almost every single organism. Um, some are immune, but really at any organism is a threat to one of these viruses. Now, these viruses are not all bad. Sometimes, remember I talked about that lysing, that bursting? So sometimes they will explode a cell, not good for the cell, but that dead cell, that dead little cell materials, meaning all the organelles on the inside, the cytoplasm, all of those proteins, right, will actually get used by other organisms. In fact, a lot of the times they get dissolved into what's called dissolved organic material. So it basically just means edible material, organic material, floating around in the ocean. So there's little bits of, honestly, body parts of these little cells that are just floating around in the ocean, which seems kind of gross, but a ton of organisms rely on this DOM or dissolved organic material as a food source. So if you ever see filter feeders or suspension feeders, usually what they're doing is they're kind of just sifting through the water, or literally if you're a sponge, filtering the water, trying to get out some of this dissolved organic material, some of this DOM. So not always a bad thing um, that these, um, viruses end up bursting some of their cells. Well, not their cells, but they infect anybody else and then they burst their cells. Rude. But, you know, again, creating food sources so the nutrients end up getting recycled, which is a good thing. All right, so let's talk about prokaryotes. Remember, prokaryotes, very, very small, very simple. Um, usually some kind of geometric shape, small rods, spirals, circles, something like that. Um, they do not have a nucleus. Pro means before, karyot means nucleus, before the nucleus. So prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. Um, they are usually singular with their DNA. So as we have a double helix, twisting, big, long strand of DNA, usually there is this very small, simple, and circular, singular and circular. Um, let's see, most of them do have a cell wall. Who else do we know that has a cell wall? <gasps> Plant cells, plants and algaes have cell walls. 
So that is a similarity between prokaryotic cells and plant cells. Remember, plant cells and algaes are eukaryotes, right? Eukaryotes. These are prokaryotes. So one similarity, similarity that they do have is that plant cells have a cell wall and so do prokaryotes. Um, and they do have great metabolic diversities. We're not really going to get too much into their actual metabolic diversities, um, except for a brief mention of the archaeans. And the archaeans are what's known as extremophiles. These guys love it extreme. Super, super salty, they love it. Super hot, they love it. Freezing cold, these guys probably love it. They just love the extreme temperatures and that, well, extreme conditions. And that's because nobody else has really been able to thrive and live there. But the archaeans are do great there. In fact, the archaean has been around since the earth was really nasty and inhospitable to most organisms. These guys loved it. Then it started to get becoming more oxygenated. It started becoming cooler. We started to get nicer temperatures, not such high salinities. And these guys were like, no, I like it extreme. So these guys actually s survived in the most extreme places on the planet and are still there. And they're still rocking it because they love these extreme conditions. Um, uh, let's see, let's, let's look at some of these. This is a, um, this is a hot geyser. Basically this is temperature is exceeding 700 Celsius. Super hot. In fact, these geysers, some of these natural occurring geysers have phosphate and sulfur and naturally occurring acids that are just bubbling out of here. Now there actually was a horrific story not too long ago of a couple that snuck behind one of the little barriers to go close and take a selfie. This guy's trying to pose in front of this geyser right here and he slips in and it's so acidic that he literally within seconds is completely dissolved. By the time his fiance turned around to go yell, help, 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 someone save me, she turned back, he's gone, completely gone. Because these areas are just super hot, super salty. The acids that are just boiling out of the, the planet's crust is insane. But the Archaeans absolutely love them. So those deep sea hydrothermal vents that are spewing this sulfur and this nasty stuff that's black and would kill anything else. Huge temperature differentiations, differentiations, meaning like thousand degrees on one end, three degrees on the other. Just insane. Archaeans absolutely love it. I know. Crazy. They are extremophiles. That's pretty much all we're going to talk about um, Archaeans, but we are going to talk about bacteria. So let's get into some of these microbes. Remember, they're all microbes because they're all very, very tiny. So bacteria are extremely abundant. You guys have probably learned in the last couple months that there are a lot of things out there that are trying to kill us or infect us or just make us sick. And bacteria is no, no exception. In fact, marine bacteria is something that you need to kind of watch out for. Um, they say like, oh, salt water is good for the wounds. Ah, there's a lot of marine bacteria out there that you probably don't want to get into your system. Um, however, your body's immune system is pretty good at dealing with it. Okay, but it can affect other organisms, so we're going to talk about that later on in the semester. But like I said, bacteria usually come in several different geometric shapes. You've got your rods, your spirals, your circles, all that kind of stuff. Um, most of these guys do have a cell wall. Uh, it is semi-permeable, meaning some things can come in and out. But it's pretty rigid to keep it nice and secure and, and keep those... Um, non-organelles safe because remember they don't have organelles but you still want to keep your DNA intact and you don't want to lose that and that comes from the protection of the cell wall um let's see they do have a variety of different shapes oh, we already talked about that we're not really going to be tested on that we would probably see it in the lab but since we're not going to be in the lab we're probably not going to be going over that too much but one thing that they do do and this is something really really important is they break down stuff so bacteria are known as decomposers. This is one of the most important roles that they play in our ecosystem is to decompose things. Otherwise, we would just have dead bodies and dead decaying things all over our planet. And that is not what we want. We want these nutrients to become usable again. And that's actually what these guys do. They take it and they break it down into different forms of what's called detritus. Now detritus is like dead and decaying material. So I'm sure you can think of a variety of different types of dead and decaying dead and decaying material, including, you know, dead bodies, sloughed off skin cells, uh, hair that breaks off, that's just decaying, leaves that fall down. Um, I hate to say it, poop. We're going to talk a lot about poop and dead bodies, but poop and dead bodies, those are detritus, right? Detritus, de uh, dissolved organic material. All of these are food sources. This is usable bits of nutrients. And when you live in a place that maybe nutrients are kind of lacking for you, you need to get them however you can. 
And sometimes this means eating poop and dead bodies. Luckily, you're not a marine organism, so you don't have to worry about that. All right. Um, let's talk about cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is blue-green bacteria. So that's what cyano means, blue-green. These guys are photosynthetic, so they are producing photosynthesis, right? They're doing photosynthesis, they're making sugars, they're producing oxygen, and they're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So these guys are good. We want cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is our friend. Now this is something that we would have seen in lab in person. We actually had a bunch of different cyanobacteria samples living that you guys can actually look at. But until then, we can actually Google them, and you can see lots of different ex examples of them. One of them, one of the byproducts of the cyanobacteria is called a stromolite. And a stromolite is actually pretty cool. I think I can see it right here. They're formed by these cyanobacteria as a byproduct, and they look like these little rocks right here. So if you've ever been to the tropics, the Caribbean, you can see these little stromolites. And essentially, it's just these calcium buildup of these byproducts of this photosynthetic cyanobacteria. So this is what it is. This is, um, I believe this is oscillatoria right here. I thought this is oscillatoria or anabaena. One of the two. But it's a classic chain of, you can see all these tiny, tiny little circular bacteria which are all connected to each other. Now they are working together as a whole, but they are separate individual bacteria. So this would be known as like a colony. So you can see this would be a single stranded colony of, um, what did I say? Oscillatoria or anabaena, one of the two. To me, it kind of looks like anabaena, but it might be oscillatoria. Now, it does sometimes form these huge colonies, also known as blooms. So you can get these cyanobacteria blooms. Not always a good thing. They can actually suck up all of the CO2 from the water, creating all sorts of problems from other organisms. But remember, they're photosynthetic, so they are putting back oxygen into the environment. But these are the stromolites that I'm talking about right here. So you can obviously say they look like rocks, but they're actually byproducts of this microscopic cyanobacteria, but they are millions of years old, millions of years old. Obviously, a little tiny bacteria cannot produce a giant rock like that, you know, this big, without it taking a long, long, long time. All right. Let's get into the different types of uh, metabolic diversity that these bacteria can have. Now, but metabolic diversity means how are you getting your energy? That's all that that means. You can be photosynthetic. That's a type of metabolic. Um, metabolism and in fact that's our first one is photosynthetic right these guys are deriving their energy from the light photosynthetic synthesis means to create they're creating with light now on the all the flip side of that what if you live on the bottom of the ocean and there is no light then you can actually do what's called chemosynthesis or creating sugar from chemicals okay so we're actually creating our energy using chemicals that are naturally found say coming off these hydrothermal vents these really really nasty plumes of grossness that are coming out. Um, some of these chemoautotrophs or these chemo um, synthesis organisms absolutely love it and so they take it and they can turn it around via these chemical reactions and turn it into usable bits of energy. And finally we have heterotrophs which means different feeders or those is us. We can't make anything. We are not synthetic. We can't make anything so we need to consume. We actually need to eat. You can be herbivores, you can be a predator or a carnivore or an omnivore but you do need to consume your own nutrients. So making energy from light, making energy from chemicals, and then actually eating your energy from someone else. So we, we would eat a salad because that salad was able to get sun energy, turn into photosynthesis into sugar energy, and then we can eat that salad and then get actual energy. All right, let's talk about diatoms. So these diatoms are very, very abundant in the ocean. Remember, they're not just in the ocean, they're all over our planet, but especially in the ocean, they are really important primary producers. Remember that base level of the food chain, the food web that we talked about um, in the marine ecology lecture? This is basically how we get all of our usable bits of energy and the entire planet comes from these primary producers. So these diatoms are hugely important. They outnumber plants like a hundred thousand to one. There's so many of them. Yes, they're small, they're not as efficient, but they're still doing this primary producing, and that's super important, and that's how we get all of our usable bits of energy is from these primary producers, so very, very crucial. Um, now, they are photosynthetic, so they do have color-absorbing pigments like chlorophyll A, chlorophyll C, and carotenoids, or carotenes, basically the thing that makes the leaves turn yellow and orange in the fall, those are carotenes. Now, these guys do have a shell, what's called a frustule. It is made of uh, basically usually two halves, kind of like a petri dish. 
it works like a top half and a bottom half they kind of fit into each other so they do live protected inside of this little frustule and most of them are unitary uh sorry yeah solitary or um colonial but most of the time they're just unif unicellular and solitary now here is a picture of a lot of different diatoms so this isn't one whole diatom this is lots of different diatoms so you can see here we have this round centric shape centric is the round ones we have these elongated pen shaped ones those are the pennate ones p-e-n-n-a-t pennate you also have the little triangular ones sometimes little star shapes sometimes little bean shapes all sorts of different tiny shapes now like the bacteria they're simple geometric shapes so an easy way to tell the difference is if you look at one of these they automatically look more complicated than the bacteria remember the anabiena that we just looked at it's very very it's like a single green circle but this actually if you look at this frustule you can see all of these little complications and these little tiny minute details in the frustule and therefore you know it can't be a prokaryote it must be bigger and more complicated now the frustrule again, that petri dish, we have the top half and we have the bottom half and all you have to do is just connect them just like that. And inside you can actually see the little nucleus. We have the chloroplast running on the outside which allows them to do photosynthesis. And finally we have these big old oil droplets. Now these oil droplets are really important for these guys because they are photosynthetic. They need to remain on the top of the water column. They don't want to sink down to the bottom where it's dark and cold. They're going to starve and die. So they need to stay on the top of the water column where it's nice and, you know, light. And therefore, this oil droplets, because oil floats, is going to keep them lifted. It's going to keep them up and floating towards the top of the surface where all the light is. And that's super important for these guys because they are photosynthetic. So these oil droplets aid in what's called buoyancy or the ability to float. And that's going to keep them up on the surface. Now, I do say float because these guys are what's called planktonic. And to be planktonic means you're a floater. You are at the mercy of the currents. You are just going to float around and there's nothing you can do about it. So these guys are important when it comes to these phytoplankton or floating plants. And they aren't really plants, but we kind of categorize them like that because again, they are doing photosynthesis. So the basal level of the food chain or the base level of the food chain is very important. So are these guys. Super important. So diatoms, photosynthetic, very abundant, super important primary productivity. Um, come in very simple shapes like the centric or the pennate. Um, little stars, stuff like that, covered in their frustule, their shell, which reproduces by, again, if we look at, ah, I'm getting too, getting ahead of myself, reproduces by what's called cellular division, or in this case, um, asexual cellular division, where you can actually just pick apart the top half and the bottom half, then this replicates a new bottom, this replicates a new half, top half, and then you have two new diatoms. Now they can go through a form of um, sexual reproduction, but we're not really gonna talk about that. We're really just gonna focus on the asexual reproduction. Where basically they just split and one half secretes the other and now they have two full um, diatoms. What else, did I miss anything here? Oh, I did, I totally jumped ahead of this. Now, these guys are floating around. They're at the mercy of the currents, hence they are planktonic. But what's really important about these guys, because they're such a source of food, is the fact that some of them have what's called domoic acid in them. Now, domoic acid is a little toxin, toxin, um, and in small doses, it's no big deal. It's totally fine. However, when these guys get into these big blooms and these big bursts of, or these huge groups, what happens is what's called bioaccumulation. And remember, we talked about this already in marine ecology. Bioaccumulation is the buildup of all of these toxins. So even though you have just a little bit in each one, Say you're a filter feeder like shellfish and other small fish, and you're filtering them out of the water, which means you're not just having one, maybe you're having a thousand every hour. So now it's building up inside of you. Now you're actually full of toxins. And say someone like me goes to eat that shellfish, and I don't just have one you know, oyster, I have a dozen oysters. So now each one had a thousand milligrams or whatever. Now I just ate 1,200, 12,000 milligrams of toxins. So in small doses, it's not a big deal, but when you're larger and you're eating lots of these organisms that have a little bit of this stuff in them, it bioaccumulates and magnifies. So I get a lot more toxins than I should. And this is exactly why you're not supposed to eat things like oysters and clams and stuff in certain parts of the, certain times of the year. It's not that the oysters are bad by any means. It's that, that these guys have been in huge blooms, the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, which we're gonna learn about, they get in these huge blooms, they have a little bit of these toxins in it, now the oyster is full of that toxin. OK, 
Okay, and that's what you want to avoid during. Um, I think when it comes to oysters, it's every month that doesn't have an R in it. Like September, December, January, right? Those are all okay. But if you get to August, July, June, May, don't eat shellfish when it comes to those non-R months. And I have every once in a while, and no, it's not going to kill you, but it can make you sick. And if your body can't deal with these toxins, you might keep them around for far too long, and that can do some serious damage to you. All right, we already talked about that. Um, this is a form of sexual reproduction. Again, we're just briefly going to talk about that they do have sexual reproduction. Basically, one sends the sperm to the other one with the egg, but don't worry about that. We're just going to be focusing on the asexual part. Or again, you have the two halves of the frustule. They open up, they separate, and then they actually build or secrete these new frustules so that you now have new diatoms. That's all. All right, so let's talk about our next group of microbes, the dinoflagellates. So these are flagellates, meaning they have flagella. In this case, they have two flagella. Dinoflagellates. These guys are mostly marine. They're also photosynthetic, so primary producers, yes. Not nearly as important as diatoms because they're not in as high as abundance as diatoms, but still very important. Um, like I said, they do have two flagella for the swimming. Most of the time they have one going around their waist and then one coming down. This is a typical dinoflagellate right here. I always said it kind of looks like the Eiffel Tower. Right? It's got the legs, it's got the little lookout tower, and then it's got the tongue, long spire. The other common one that we're going to look at kind of looks like the Death, um, the Death Star in Star Wars. It's like a big ball with kind of like a belt going around it. Again, that belt has one fl uh, flagella that's going to help them go left or right, and then they're going to have one long one that comes down below and that's going to help them go forward and back. So that's how they actually swim around. So yes, they are using their flagella to swim, but they are still considered planktonic. They can swim up and down a little bit, but they can't fight against the currents. So remember, if you're at the mercy of the currents, you are planktonic. So these guys, very much planktonic because they are at the mercy of the currents. Now, these guys are super fun because they are kind of what's going on right now. Um, if you've been to the beach anytime over the summer um, or really at certain times of the year and you've seen bioluminescence, that's these guys. These are dinoflagellate blooms where the dinoflagellates get in huge numbers and they're just reproducing like crazy and all of a sudden they're so high in abundance we can actually see the bio the um, biofluorescence. So essentially what's happening is when they get disturbed they let off this little glow and when it's just one or two of them you can't see it but when it's millions of them you can see it and the entire the waves glow the water glows I've been actually snorkeling with it it's so amazing it's like you're pushing the stars aside to go swimming it's the coolest thing ever if you ever have a chance to do it do it it's not even scary I know you're like I'm swimming around at night you can see everything everything if a fish swim swims by you can see the fish and the trail from when it disturbed them as it swam by it's the coolest thing guys coolest thing so bioluminescence are dinoflagellates so if you've ever been out there I know we had a big one last year if you saw that you, that you can thank your local dinoflagellate for it so again, here's two very common dinoflagellates. This is the little Eiffel Tower looking guy, and this is the Death Star looking guy, which you can also see right here. Again, just round with kind of like a belt going on. It's obviously more complicated than a bacteria, so it's not going to be a bacteria, also much larger than a bacteria. Uh, but very common dinoflagellates. Now, on a test, I could put a picture of one of these guys up there, and you might not be able to see that there's two flagella, but look for these general shapes. Very different than the dino, um, diatoms that we already looked at, and very different than the cyanobacteria. These guys, very easily recognizable. And bioluminescence. If, it re if it's responsible for bioluminescence, it's going to be your dinoflagellate. Oh, just gorgeous. And it really does. I mean, yes, the exposure on these photos have been expanded a little bit, but it really does look like this. It's just, just stars in the water. It's so cool. So cool. All right, so another super important type of dinoflagellate that is really crucial to our planet is zooxanthellae. So this zooxanthellae, or what's called zooxanthellae algae, remember these are kind of like plants. They're microscopic microbes. They're not plants. They're not animals. They're microbes. Okay, these guys are super important because they live inside corals. They are symbiotic with corals. They live inside the tissues of the corals, and this is what actually gives the coral reef their color. So what you can see in here is this is a little coral polyp, this is a little cnidarian, and inside these little dark speckles, these little dark spots, that's actually the zooxanthellae. So the zooxanthellae does photosynthesis, producing sugars which the little polyp eats. 
So then the polyp gets food, the zooxanthellae gets a place to live. It's very symbiotic. Okay, however, sometimes what happens is the conditions aren't right and therefore these corals end up expelling out their zooxanthellae. They're like, um, the, the ocean's getting acidic, it's getting really hot in here, I don't know what to do, I'm panicking. So they kick out their little symbiont, but their symbiont was feeding them. So they actually kicked out the thing that was saving their lives and therefore that's when corals actually start to lose their color and they start to bleach and die. It's because they freaked out because conditions aren't good, probably because of pollution, probably because of us, and they start kicking out these zooxanthellae. So zooxanthellae are super, super important. The coral reefs are some of the most productive places in the entire world. And it's all due to the zooxanthellae. Without the reef, you wouldn't have anything else. They are the basis of that whole ecosystem. And really, it comes down to the zooxanthellae. So really, really crucial, important species here. And that's what you can see right here. So again, in living inside one of these individual polyps, and these corals are going to have thousands of polyps. So living in the tissues of each one of these polyps are these tiny little zooxanthellae, which give them this dark, dark color, right? Sometimes they're purple, sometimes they're red, sometimes they're brown, but when they lose that zooxanthellae, they bleach and they turn white. And this is a picture of the same coral head. And all that bleach is essentially the coral dying and starving to death. And it's just leaving its empty skeleton. Super sad, super sad, guys. I talk all about this in my coral reef lecture. I don't mean to bum you out, but this is why we need to do things like recycle, we need to reduce our plastic waste, and we need to stop our CO2 emissions. This is why we're killing our oceans and our poor little corals. And I can't do anything about it. All right, let's move on. Let's keep talking about dinoflagellates for a little bit. All right, so some of them can actually do photosynthesis, and some of them are actually kind of parasitic. So these guys are not always so fun and beautiful and photosynthetic and look at me I'm creating bioluminescence sometimes they're actually really nasty like Physera. Uh, Physera is just really nasty just a really nasty little dinoflagellate that actually can cause what's called toxic shock syndrome in humans so this can actually poison shellfish and again this is another one that infects those shellfish that we don't want to eat so diatoms can do this, dinoflagellates can do this. When they bloom, they get these high numbers and they have these toxins and they cause these nasty things like, especially for these dinoflagellates, neurological disorders. So messing with your brain, literally messing with your brain. Um, so your brain starts to actually affect your nervous system and that's your motor functions. That's like your whole body. So this can create um, some really, really nasty stuff. And again, it's all the result of these blooms. So if conditions are right for these guys, they have all the nutrients they need, they have all the sunlight they need, the temperatures are just good, these guys go crazy and start reproducing like mad, and then all of a sudden you get these blooms, which can be very, very toxic to fish, especially to us if you're actually in the water. Like, there are whole times of the year you're not allowed to swim in the San Francisco Bay because blooms are going on and therefore can actually cause this, like, nervous system shutdown just based on these microscopic dinoflagellates, which is super crazy. Um, they can also cause red tides. Now, red tides aren't super bad for us necessarily. You can, most people just see the, the ocean is red and avoid it, but can be very toxic to fishes. Um, so these guys are basically sucking up all the dissolved gases in the, in, the, in the water, as well as just accumulating all of these toxins. Remember, each one has a tiny little bit of toxin. And then the fish are now swimming around. They're swimming in thousands and thousands, and they're getting in their mouth, they're getting in their system, they're getting in their tissues, and that's it. This red blood looking tide is all just millions, if not billions of these microscopic dinoflagellates, which can be very, very nasty to the ecosystem. I know, what are you gonna do? Fish kills, happens all the time. Happens every couple of years inside harbors. We'll get a random bloom of some of these dinoflagellates that get stuck in the harbor and then they go crazy and reproduce like mad. And then all of a sudden, all the fish in the harbor will die off. But don't worry, the ocean is resilient and it can come back if we leave it alone. We leave it alone. All right, moving on to our next type of microbe. This is our silicoflagellates and our coccolithophores. So silicoflagellates kind of look like these Cheerios with spikes or like spiky stars or whatever you want to call them. These guys are right here. They are called silicoflagellates because they do have flagella, but they're also made of silica and silicoflagellates. So they do have two flagella just like the dinoflagellates. So the silicoflagellates and the dinoflagellates both have flagella. It's in the name. Once you break it down, it's actually pretty easy. 
Now these coccolithophores right here are what I call a ball of pineapple slices. So if you've ever had pineapple slices with your ham or whatever, just pineapple slices, right? If you imagine just stuffing them into a ball, that is what a coccolithophore looks like. And even the name kind of sounds round, coccolithophore, right? It's just kind of this round ball of tires or pineapple slices or whatever you want to call them. Um, but these essentially are just round balls of shells with these tiny little organisms living on the inside. And these guys are made of calcium carbonate. So this guy's made of silica, this guy's made of calcium carbonate. These are different chemical compounds that are going to use, be used as, <laughs> as <laughs> let's try this, let's rewind that one. These are different chemical compounds that are going to be used as structure and, and basically um, the strengthening material for these guys. So a lot of organisms will actually use silica or calcium carbonate as shell-like material to make it that nice, hard, protective casing. So we're going to see silica and calcium carbonate a lot throughout the semester. So just keep that in mind, kind of which one's which. And again, silicoflagellate, they're made of silica. So it's pretty easy what that to know what that one's made of. This one again, coccolithophore, a lot of C's, calcium carbonate. Hopefully that kind of helps you. That's how I always did it when I was in school. All right, so silicoflagellate or coccolithophore? Silicoflagellate, coccolithophore, right? Big round circle, big spiky Cheerio with a... No, it's a honeycomb. Big spiky honeycomb cereal. There you go. All right. Um, getting on to the protozoans, we're going to be talking about foraminifera and radiolarians. So the foraminifera essentially are tiny little shells. They look like little seashells, uh, but with a tiny little organism living on the inside. So these guys are only marine, right? They found living in these calcium carbonate shells. See, calcium carbonate, another one of those hard materials. Uh, and this guy is actually a major contributor of calcium in the ocean. So as these guys die, this calcium is naturally reabsorbed and broken down into that dissolved organic material that some other organisms will either eat to consume that and get that um, calcium or to actually just absorb it via their shells. It's really crazy how this chemistry works in the actual ocean. A uh, huge source of actual sandy material is calcium material found on beaches and stuff like that. Um, but also these guys are motile, so they don't have flagella, but they do have what's called a pseudopod or a false foot. Okay, so this false foot basically extends through these little pores that's in their shells, and that's how they can kind of be like, mm, mm, mm. So remember, these guys are still planktonic, um, they're still at the mercy of the currents, but they can move just a little bit. Excuse me. And again, they're not only moving, but they're also trying to capture food. So a lot of these pseudopods actually have this sticky coating on them. So they're not even moving at all. They're actually sticking it out to kind of just kind of poke their little finger like pseudopods around and try to pick up that dissolved organic material. And that's what we can see um, in the next picture, I believe. Okay, so these are all a variety of the different types of shells. So make sure that on the test, if I'm giving you a shell that you know that it's actually a shell of a foraminifera and not say it like a mollusk, like a clam shell or something like that. But these are very simple and again, you don't really see the opening like you do in mollusks where an organism can crawl in or out. These guys live solely inside and then kind of stick their pseudopods or projections out and then pull them in and then stick them out and pull them in. Unlike mollusca, which most mollusca will poke some of their body outside of the shell and kind of crawl around. So again, identification. If we've gone over it in lecture, I could probably put it on an exam and be like, what is this? And I'll probably give it to you as a multiple choice kind of thing to let you know that I'm not talking about mollusca. I'll be like, is it a foraminifera? Is it a silicoflagellate? Is it a coccolithophore? What is it? Okay, so make sure you can identify this stuff. Moving on to the radiolarians. So um, another one of the protozoans. These guys are also planktonic, meaning floating around. These guys are pretty much microscopic, but some of them can get pretty big. But again, all of these are in with the marine microbe lectures. They're all pretty small. These guys do have a silica shell, not calcium carbonate. They do have a silica shell. Uh, and these guys do also have pseudopods. So these little projections kind of help them float, but they also have pseudopods that will actually extend it out, grab stuff, pull it back in, extend stuff out and pull it back in and eat. So very, very important. Uh, and that's what we can see the actual pseudopods. So inside their little silica shell right here, each one of these projections is a pseudopod. That pseudopod, again, is going to trap that food where they're going to be able to bring it down. And then just basically through diffusion, they're going to just kind of break down that food particle and then diffuse through those nutrients that they need. So good use for a pseudopod, collecting food. 
Moving on to the protozoa, still with the protozoans, a different protozoan. This is our ciliates. So these ciliates don't have flagella, which is like a sperm-like whip-like tail. They have cilia, which is like tiny little hairs that just beat back and forth. That is known as cilia. Okay, this is how they can swim around because they are usually solitary. Um, these guys do have shells, but they usually have shells made out of other people's dead bodies, almost. So imagine your radiolarians and your foraminifera have died, and they have silica and calcium carbonate shells. This little silly, it's like, oh, I'm going to take that. Not going to bother making my own. I'm just going to take it from you guys, and I'm actually going to build it with just organic debris. So these guys are usually covered in some kind of coating of debris, and that's used for protection. It's also, you know, that's what shells are for. Stay away from me. I'm going to hide in my little protection. So if you can't make one, steal it. Steal little parts of it and put one together. I don't know. These guys do pretty well. But again, not flagella. These guys have cilia. And it's in the name, ciliates. And that's what you can see right here. This is their little cilia. They're going to beat this around. This is how they're going to create water currents to create food. They're going to swim around. They're going to do whatever they're going to do. Inside is the little nucleus. Inside their cells. And this guy here, this is known as their test or a lorica. So different than the frustules of the, the diatom, these guys, the ciliates, have a lorica. Which again, is kind of made up of this piece together marine debris. Last but not least, we have the fun guy. And yes, he is always invited to a party because he's a very fun guy. That's two terrible dad jokes. Mid-lecture. I know, I'm just blowing your mind today. Uh, these guys are really important when it comes to decomposers, right? These guys are breaking the stuff down into detritus. Um, dead or decaying material. Remember that detritus, super important. Where is it going to go? It's just a dead body that's going to sit there. These guys break it down into usable bits of nutrients that other organisms can absorb. So funguses, and here's a big one, is not a plant. They are not photosynthetic. That mushroom out there is not doing photosynthesis. He's actually eating something. Yeah, and funguses are pretty nasty, and they're really good at it. Man, like terrestrial funguses and stuff, they will stab you and spear you and infect you and then infect your brain and have spores poke out of your brain. I'm not joking. We are so lucky that we can't be eaten by funguses because they are nasty little predators. Not photosynthetic, predators. So anyway, but they're not all bad. They are amazing decomposers. Thank you mushrooms. Thank you funguses. Thank you mold. All of those are decomposers. Thank you funguses. Um, but another one, another thing that they're really important doing is they're what's called a pioneer species. Now they live with a type of marine algae, it's a type of uh, plant-like organism, and when they live together, this fungus and this algae together, they create what's called a lichen. So it's a symbiotic m organism that's actually made up of two different organisms, but one kind of creates the structure and the other one feeds it. It's the most crazy thing. So the fungus kind of creates the structure, whereas the algae is doing the photosynthesis. So they're kind of building around. It's a very mutualistic relationship. But these lichens, uh, L-A-C-H-E-N, they were really important um, as these like pioneer species. So in an area that maybe is a new land or nothing has been able to survive there so far, you actually have these lichens doing really, really well. So imagine we had a volcano that just erupted, and we did in Hawaii not too long ago, that created all new land. That volcanic magma will dry up and cool off and become this hardened rock. Now, there's no nutrients in that rock. There's no soil in that rock. Nothing can live in that rock except these lichens. So these lichens are pioneer species because they will actually establish themselves at these new areas, these newly, you know, available land, and they're the first ones. And they start to do nitrogen and phosphate fixation, and they start to drop nutrients down, and they actually start to create, like, soil. And so now, later on, instead of this one hard rock with no nutrients, now you actually have soil, thanks to these lichens, now plants can grow. Now animals will come. <clears throat> Excuse me, now our whole ecosystem can survive because we actually have nutrients in our soil. Thanks to these pioneer species, these lichens, which are a combination of these funguses and these algaes. Really cool stuff. I mean, super cool stuff. I mean, this is also true if you have, like, fire. A fire, well, not so much a fire, because there's nutrients in a fire. Yeah, and we're in, the, we're in marine biology anyway. I'm not going to confuse you guys. Lichens, pioneer species, first ones, they can live there. They make the environment habitable. 
so that later on other organisms can live there. And I'm not talking in just a few years. I'm talking like a million years, like a long, long time. But eventually, these lichens do a really, really great job. And they're the whole reason our planet is as green as lush as it is. So thank you, lichens. <gasps> with that said, that is the end of our lecture. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me for another fun lecture of marine biology. Hopefully you get that dad joke. He wants to run his pseudopod through her cilia, right? His false foot through her hair. Anyway, dumb, dumb dad jokes. But it's over. You don't have to listen to me anymore because marine microbes is done. Up next, we are talking about marine algaes and plants. So make sure to pay attention to the schedule. Some of these lectures are going to be an hour like this one was. Some of them, like when it comes to, I think, Ketonath, the phylum Ketonatha, there's like six slides. There's not a lot. So we're not doing one of those a day. You have to pay attention because sometimes we're doing two or three phylums in a day. So make sure that you guys are covering all those phylums before our next test because our next test goes from marine microbes, this lecture, all the way through phylum Echinodermata. So that's everything from the microbes to the plants and the algaes all the way through the invertebrates. So it's a big test coming up. Make sure you guys study hard and study well. Take care and I will see you guys next week. Don't forget to stay safe and study hard and um, take care of yourselves. Okay, bye.